Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Centre for Eye Research's Australia event, Advances in Keratoconus Research and Treatment. My name is Professor Mark Daniel. I'm the head of the corneal unit at the Eye and Ear Hospital and the head of surgical research at, at Sierra. And I'm this afternoon's host. Uh, we did hope we'd have a face-to-face -face event and get to meet you all, but um, unfortunately, with all the restrictions, we're, we're still on this um, virtual format. We're very grateful for this sort of technology, though, and it does have some advantages. And uh, I'd like to welcome all the people from interstate and overseas who, who have registered. Um, before we begin this afternoon's formalities, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which I am on, and um, I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and to their families. Um, there is an opportunity to ask questions at the end, and we've already received um, quite a few uh, really good questions that will test out our panellists and give you lots of good and useful information. If you do have a question, type it into that box on the uh, bottom end of your screen and we'll try and answer as many of those as we can um, during the session. Obviously, uh, we can't give you medical advice. Um, we can sort of answer questions in general. Um, it's always best if you see your local um, corneal specialist if you've got a really specific problem. Um, throughout the last year, we've all been sort of hampered by the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. That hasn't stopped us from um, doing our work. sujana has been working away at home um, on the computer manfully day after day, and um, we've, we've really kept going through all of the lockdowns. Um, by using uh, sort of the big data that we've collected, we've been able to analyse that, and we're doing a lot of work on... Um, innovative technology using artificial intelligence. And so we can do all this sort of work remotely. Um, all of our presenters are, are also working remotely, so I hope there's no technical hitches, but um, things seem to be going smoothly so far. I'd also like to acknowledge the, um, the Lion's Eye Donation Service, and they've played a vital role during the pandemic with um, providing corneal tissue for all of our transplants. Um, and we've been, managed to keep going with uh, with corneal transplants pretty much unaffected by all the all the all the um, breaks in elective surgery. We've got strong collaborations at the um, Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital. Uh, Elaine and I have been working there this afternoon, um, and also the University of Melbourne. And, and Paul's going to speak to us a little bit later as well. Plus, we've got um, keratoconus researchers both uh, around the country and internationally that we're. We're organising and, and using a lot of their information and data. So today we're talking about um, keratoconus and how that affects the eye and um, some updates in our research and, um, and new treatments. Um, it's fitting that this Wednesday is World Keratoconus Day, a day dedicated to raising awareness about the eye condition as well as educating and advocating for those with keratoconus. And this uh, forum really part plays a key role in, in, in that, that day. So I'm joined today with um, Dr. Srijana Sahib Jada and Associate Professor Elaine Chong from the Centre of Eye Research Australia, Professor Paul Baird uh, from the University of Melbourne. Also joining us today is a special guest, um, Erica Blake, and she's going to share her story as someone living with keratoconus. So today's um, first session is um, a panel discussion between Srijana and Erica. Srijan is a, originally an optometrist and now a research scientist with a special interest in keratoconus. She's a senior research fellow at the Centre for Eye Research Australia and, and at the University of Melbourne. She established the Australian study of keratoconus, one of the world's largest projects on keratoconus, and uh, conducts multifaceted research will, which will allow for better detection and management um, of different stages of keratoconus and hopefully then prevent um, really severe visual loss. Um, joining Eric, joining Sujana is Erica. She lives with keratoconus and today she's going to share her experience from a patient's perspective. As an advocate for Sierra's keratoconus research program, Erica is also helping to raise awareness to others like her living with the corneal condition. Welcome Sujana and Erica. Thanks Mark. 
Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Erica, for being here this evening uh, and talking uh, talking to us about care to Kunis from the patient's perspective. I Thank really appreciate you. you joining us. Sorry, I really appreciate you joining us despite you undergoing the corneal transplantation just a month ago and you resuming work today. Yeah. And this really resonates your passion towards raising awareness about keratoconus. For those who are meeting you for the first time, could you please tell us about yourself and your journey with keratoconus? Sure. Thanks, Trijana. So uh, just to give a little bit of context, my name is Erica Blake. Uh, I'm 46 years old. I live out in Horsham in Western Victoria, so a fair way from all of my specialists in Melbourne. Uh, I'm married to Adam. Uh, I have three beautiful girls. So my oldest is Della. She's 16. I have Acacia, who is 14. And my little girl, Gretel, is 10. So uh, I currently work as an assistant director with the National Disability Insurance Agency. Uh, and I look after the operations component of some of um, the NDIA work across Victoria. So my journey with uh, keratoconus uh, started 28 years ago uh, in my final year of year 12. So I was just about to finish school. Um, and yeah, so ker keratoconus and I, I guess, have walked uh, hand in hand ever since then, Trujana. So um, yeah, I guess it's, um, yeah, it's been quite a journey throughout those years. Isn't that an incredible journey of 25 plus years, Erica? And what I'm personally impressed by just what you said is you've raised three beautiful daughters and I must really appreciate that you're a very positive and optimistic person that despite having these visual dis disturbances for such a long time, you're still working and uh, you're a very determined person that clearly shows your positive spirit. Hats off to that. Now, just okay. rewinding your memories, when you said you've been diagnosed with keratoconus at, such, uh, at year 12, when and how did you notice that your vision was deteriorating for the first time and what symptoms did you actually notice, Erica? So I didn't notice, which is quite a, quite a frightening uh, thought in hindsight um, and probably even more frightening by the fact that my sister had already been diagnosed probably three or four years prior. So, you know, I guess my mum and dad were quite, um, you know, well, as familiar as you could be with um, um, keratoconus back in those days. But it was actually that I was sitting up on a bench one morning having a coffee with my mum and she looked across the bench um, and, and instantly noticed that I was squinting. So I guess, you know, from that previous experience with my sister, um, it was actually my mum that realised I couldn't see. So, you know, and I always say you only know what you know. We only see what we see uh, and we make the most of that. So you don't really know unless you've seen perfect vision um, what it's like to see properly in the first place. So I just managed, um, probably did sit at the front of the class, but didn't take any notice um, of those symptoms myself. And that's kind of a classic characteristic of early keratoconus, also referred to as subclinical keratoconus erica, which does not produce any symptoms. And that's why it goes unnoticed by many patients. And accurate detection of this early stage of keratoconus is an important characteristic clinically for screening of refractive surgery patients as well. However, diagnosing this early stage of keratoconus is clinically challenging as well, unless specific tests such as corneal topography are performed. I'll just cover about it later in the talk and Elaine would be talking about it probably in her talk as well, because vision is really good and corneal curvature, which is one of the main characteristic of keratoconus also remains unchanged. That is why it is important for at-risk patients uh, for keratoconus to undergo a regular comprehensive eye test, including corneal topography. Now, once you've been diagnosed with keratoconus, Erica, how has it impacted your life? Well, there's been lots of ups and downs throughout those 28 years, that's for sure. I've, um, it's certainly, you know, I mean, it impacted on my functional vision. So um, probably no more so than it is right now. Um, but, you know, I've had, I guess this is just my third, my third corneal transplant. So I'd had a left and a right transplant early on, um, going back to 96, 97. Um, and then I've just had a repeat transplant on my left eye going back four weeks ago today, actually. So, you know, throughout that time, I've had multiple trips to Melbourne. So I'd love a dollar for every kilometre I've travelled um, in the name of keratoconus or my journey with keratoconus, um, because I guess that eight hour return trip um, that my parents, you know, just did 
they didn't, you know, didn't even look sideways at it. They just always made sure that we got those, um, got to those appointments. Um, you know, throughout that time, I've had multiple um, rejection episodes. So I've required, you know, trips five days apart to go and have cortisone injections in my eyes. You know, but I guess the other thing um, to think about, you know, is for many people, it's the financial impact as well. You know, and I guess added to that financial impact, I mean, I would have that if I lived in Melbourne. But, you know, travelling from Horsham, you know, it costs me fuel, it costs accommodation. You know, we talk about topography, um, you know, there's not the kind of Medicare rebates available for that diagnosis um, kind of side of things from, from where I sit either. So, you know, for many years I've been charged for all of those things, plus the cost of surgery, um, glasses, contact lenses. You know, I don't even have um, a local contact lens um, specialist fitter of contact lenses in Horsham. So we travel to Melbourne um, for that. So anyone that's ever gone through the process of having hard contact lenses fitted um, and to get them comfortable, um, yeah, you don't do that without those specialist contact lens fitters that are only available in our metro sites or metro areas, really. Yeah, yeah. So many important features that you've kind of mentioned, Erica. Uh, most importantly, unlike com other common eye conditions like diabetic retinopathy or age-related macular degeneration, keratoconus has its onset, like in your case, in early teens and adulthood. It then progresses throughout one's uh, poor education, prime earning and child rearing years, and thus has an impact significantly throughout the life. And as you also correctly mentioned, some of them think corneal transplantation is a treatment and then it kind of solves the problem, but it's not. You have to undergo these frequent checkups, frequent change in contact lenses and regular visits to the eye care practitioner. So it's a lifelong burden in terms of the impact that it has financially as well as on the quality of life. So very important characteristics that you have mentioned, very typical of keratoconus. Now, you've just mentioned that True, your sister also has been diagnosed with keratoconus. How important is it for you to understand the risk factors of what cause keratoconus, Erica? Yeah, and I guess, again, living, as I mentioned, I live in Western Victoria, so we're a big farming community. Um, so it seems that pollen seems to be pretty popular in farming communities. Um, so, you know, we learned very early on that rubbing eyes, if I see my kids so much as even raise a hand um, towards their eyes, you know, it's, I guess, you know, hindsight you know I've at least got that now um, and something that you know on all of those occasions that you and I call or have these random conversations I seem to be taking my children to get their eyes checked so you know between I just wish and I'm so pleased now that with the great work that you guys have done you know my kids journey is going to look very very different to the one that I've traveled and it does make me emotional to think how far we've come because you know, knowing that journey, my sister and I have both travelled to know that in the worst case, and, and certainly Della, my oldest daughter, is being watched closely by an ophthalmologist in Melbourne now as well. Um, you know, don't, it, 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 my call out is make sure you get your kids to get their eyes checked regularly. Don't just assume that they're going to tell you uh, that their vision is poor because nine times out of 10, they don't know their vision is poor. Uh, and that's why the optometrist, we need to treat our optometrist like our dental appointments, you know, they're six monthly, um, at least get get your kids to the optometrist once every year. Yeah. Because yes. cross-linking now, you know, if I could have had that, it's it's amazing. And to even to watch the early stages of the research that went on um, when cross-linking was just something that was being talked about was so exciting. And seeing and hearing what you guys are up to now, um, it yeah, it does make our futures look a whole lot brighter. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. And as you kind of mentioned, you're not, and as you may know, you're not alone in this journey of uh, trying to answer or understand this problem as to what causes the condition. Uh, the costs are not covered by Medicare and pri private health insurance. And what are the answers? How can we early detect this condition? So all these questions uh, which have uh, been asked to me or to the other researchers made us establish the Australian study of keratoconus. As you can see in the slide, uh, we established this biggest study, which is a well-characterized study to, with the main aims of uncovering the risk factors for keratoconus and early detection of keratoconus, as well as improving the management strategies. And if you move on to the next slide, these are the publications to date that we have to understand the different aspects of keratoconus, including the genetics. Next one is the clinical. Next slide, please. 
the gen uh, clinical aspects as well as environmental risk factors. Next slide. And we also uh, did the study on economic burden of keratoconus as well as the impact of keratoconus on the quality of life. And we spoke about early detection, early keratoconus and corneal topography. And as Mark mentioned during COVID, when we were working remotely, we were using innovative approaches for early detection of keratoconus. Penticam, you would have heard of it, which is the most advanced corneal topography system that collects over 1,000 Penticam parameters and is able to detect subclinical keratoconus. We have used these images uh, to kind of uh, an, uh, early detect the keratoconus. However, this cannot be analyzed manually. So you, we used artificial intelligence to identify the best performing parameters and come up with an objective model for the early detection of keratoconus. So these, this is the work that we have been doing last year or this year when we were working remotely. So this will obviously be helpful uh, for the next generations, like as you were saying, for your daughter, hopefully, when we can kind of use this AI models for the better detection of the condition. Erika, I also would like to take this opportunity to thank you and the study participants for participating in the research, because if not for your involvement, we would not be able to fill in the knowledge gaps uh, that are currently there in keratoconus and make a difference to those who are living with keratoconus now and in the future. Would you like to add in anything about patient participation in the keratoconus and clinical trials, Erica? No, but only to get behind and support it, I guess, is, uh, is, the, is the message there because we all come from different parts of the country as well. So, you know, we all have our own story to tell and I think, you know, it's a part of that puzzle, isn't it, that, you know, the best outcomes from research and further development and future development will come from the input of those people that, that walk in the shoes um, and, and live with keratoconus every day. That's right. And I would also like to extend my appreciation to all the funding sources that supported our research, without which we couldn't have conducted so many projects. I'm proud to say that Keratoconus Research has received continued financial support from several philanthropic bodies like Keratoconus Australia and Impact Perpetual Funding. And this is very crucial for a condition like Keratoconus, which is not commonly known as Alzheimer's, that can attract government funding. Special thanks to Larry Kornhosher, the president Keratoconus Australia for supporting today's event as well as his continued support for our research. And thank you once again, Erica, for joining us in tonight's forum. I had the privilege of talking to you several times and every time I learned something new from the patient's perspective about the condition. It's also amazing how intricate, you know, this topic is, but you make it seem very easy and very simple to understand. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it and happy to be involved. Thank you. See you now. Great, thank you, Srijana and Erica. That was uh, that was terrific. I can't um, emphasize what Srijana was saying anymore. It's really important to us to hear our patients' stories, and from that we we do work that's uh, relevant to, to making their lives better. For example, that uh, economic um, benefit, the economic cost of keratoconus uh, study that we did was really from patients sort of saying, you know, we can't get um, funding for contact lenses, we can't get funding for topography. You know, the cross-linking at that time was very expensive and we could, we could then analyse all of that information, write up a paper and then take that to government and say, look, we really need to get um, Medicare funding for cross-linking. And it becomes a very compelling argument when you've got you know, patients sort of pleading for it and, and we're just translating their words into words that the bureaucrats understand. Srijana will be sticking around for questions at the end, so um, send them through via the, uh, the chat. We've already got uh, more than 10 questions and uh, over 70 people involved. The next person I'd like to welcome is uh, Professor Paul Baird. Uh, he's presenting on genetics and the implications for treatment in keratoconus. Paul has had over 25 years of experience in um, the field of genetics and is a senior NHMRC fellow based at the University of Melbourne, and he works closely with us uh, here at the Ionia Hospital and at CIRA. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Mark. So, uh, thanks for the introduction. So a very, um, I guess, challenging story from Erica there about uh, her 
uh, journey through keratoconus. And, and hopefully what I can share with you today is, is something, uh, what we've been trying to do for the last few years is, is really work out what causes keratoconus genetically um, and how we can look at different risk factors um, and help patients and their families with keratoconus going forward. So I'll just talk about genetics, but um, interestingly, um, listening to Erica, you know, I mean, it's, each story is very personal. And certainly in keratoconus, we see the split between people who just appear to develop keratoconus at almost at random, which are the, we call the sporadic cases, and those who have a familial origin. So it's around about 3% of keratoconus cases have a familial origin. And the importance of genetics in these um, individuals is that if you have keratoconus, then your relatives and your offspring are something like 60 times higher risk of developing keratoconus uh, compared to the general population. So a huge increased risk uh, in these family cases. Uh, and I think that's why Erica is very uh, concerned about her children uh, in, in terms of developing keratoconus down the track. We also know that genetic sort of plays a role because many individuals with keratoconus uh, seem to also have Down syndrome uh, and other syndromes as well, such as Leber's congenital amaurosis. So, so there are other things that are happening uh, in, in individuals with keratoconus. So we're not really clear whether these other syndromes develop uh, keratoconus or keratoconus develop these syndromes. So this is something we're still trying to work out. Um, in terms of the cornea, we, we really want to uh, look at changes in the cornea. We're looking at clinical changes. And again, we know that genetics is highly correlated with these clinical changes in the cornea. Um, and there have actually been a number of genes that have been identified with keratoconus. So we are making progress in this area. Here's an example of a, of a family with keratoconus. I've just made up this family, but um, the squares and circles, the squares are basically males, circles are females, and the colored in squares might be people who are who have keratoconus. And I've just put a K plus underneath those people to indicate that they might have a gene for keratoconus. But what about these two people I've just highlighted with the question marks? They're asymptomatic. They belong in a family. Uh, they could be the kids of, of somebody in the audience or kids of, of somebody you know who has keratoconus. How do we know that they're going to get keratoconus or not get keratoconus? Uh, and so this is a challenge in terms of trying to use genetics to work this out. Um, and hopefully we can use families to help us track down these keratoconus genes. And they're very important to working out genes. Many studies have been done on genetics, um, and it should be said that many of these early studies were, were, were quite small scale. They, they implicated lots of different genes, um, which sort of were a bit of a rag bag collection, and many of them couldn't be replicated in other studies. And it sort of uh, stems from the relatively small sample size that were used in a lot of the studies and also the different methodologies. But one key factor that did come up was collagen genes. These kept coming up in different studies, um, but it was unclear which particular collagen genes might be involved. Further on from that, there were other studies done uh, which suggested maybe the hepatocyte growth factor gene or some other genes involved in the corneal central thickness, which again is very important in keratoconus because we know this thins over time uh, as disease progresses. Um, so these were implications that there are genes and we are finding something that might implicate uh, a risk factor for uh, keratoconus. But really the, the interesting and I suppose the, the largest advances have really happened over the last couple of years. And this has come from a, a couple of big studies, international studies that we've been involved in, uh, which are called GWAS studies or genome-wide association studies. Um, and these use many thousands of people. So one study that we we're involved in uh, just uh, last year, actually, uh, which is an Australian, mainly an Australian study, had over 7,000 people involved in, with 1,500 keratoconus. And that identified around about two or three genes. Um, 
But there was a much larger study, again, where we were involved uh, with groups in Australia, London, Europe, and the US, which had over 120,000 patients, uh, including 10,000, uh, including 5,000 keratoconus patients. And this one identified over 36 genes associated with keratoconus. Uh, and again, we saw these collagen genes popping up. Um, but also other genes involved in, in different uh, pathways, such as cell differentiation and stem cell regulators. And we also know that the genes that were identified seem to occur in different ethnic populations as well. Now, how can we use genetics in terms of uh, going forward with keratoconus? So if we look at this very simple diagram, we have disease going from mild through moderate to severe. Um, we would like to be able to use genetics to predict disease for early treatment. So the earlier we can find an individual with any sign of keratoconus, the better, because we have a better chance of actually giving them some kind of treatment early on, which might stop or prevent or, or at least slow the progression of the disease. If we look at different treatment options, we go through a standard uh, regimen, which might be glasses or contact lenses, uh, through cross-linking, and right through to corneal transplantation, which Eric just mentioned before. And again, genetics can play a role here in predicting who might best respond to a treatment. Um, and, you know, genes such as collagen genes and cross-linking, there are already studies out there that suggest that certain collagen genes uh, may be more important in um, successive cross-linking compared to other uh, particular collagen genes. So again, we can start to dissect out the role of genes in different diseases. If we go back to this, uh, an example of a family again, say we had a, a patient here, a parent, um, and three kids, they, these two kids might be asymptomatic for keratoconus, um, and this, this person may have disease. And so we, again, we'd like to be able to screen a, a key set of genes we like to be able to look at their demographic and risk factors, such as are they exposed to pollens? Are they exposed to uh, different uh, allergens in, in the environment? And are they rubbing their eyes as a result of this? Um, but also we'd like to be able to, to screen people in the community. And, you know, Erica highlighted uh, one of the challenges, certainly in Australia and around the world, is distance um, and distance from big metro sites. Um, and so if we could have some better way of community screening, um, then we, maybe we can detect these early clinical changes um, at, a, at a very early stage before um, children or individuals actually develop keratoconus. And again, this links in with the artificial intelligence studies that we're doing, where we may be able to plug this into a, a telehealth type of approach uh, to actually start screening people. And again, anybody in this side of, of the the cartoon that I'm showing uh, could have a key set of genes screened uh, or clinical factors to look at their risk. And we can develop some kind of genetic risk profile for an individual, and perhaps we can offer them a clinical intervention at a very early stage. So the conclusions to genetics are really that if we can detect early subclinical keratoconus, for instance, when there's no uh, obvious signs, then we have a much better chance of preserving vision and stopping disease progression. Um, we can also um, improve um, our idea of what risk might be in terms of uh, progression. Um, so again, we can look at different genes and how they may impact on progression to, to help us develop these what we would call genetic risk scores. Um, and also we can look at individuals to separate out those people who may just have refractive errors uh, versus those who actually have early signs of keratoconus in terms of their genes and, and the, the genes that they carry. Um, and of course, you know, we can use this to look at the treatment successes, whether certain peoples with certain genetic backgrounds have a much improved outcome or a worse outcome. Um, and we can tailor therapies to those individuals. And also because we know more about the genes, we have access now to more targets um, and also the development potentially of new treatments that could be using keratoconus that could be adjuncts to cross-linking or even replace cross-linking down the track. So I'm gonna leave it there and uh, 
obviously later on we'll, we'll be taking questions, um, but thank you for your attention tonight. Uh, thank you, Paul. That was great. It's, it's great to hear about our re the recent advances in the genetics of keratoconus and, and where this is leading. Uh, this research can obviously uh, not only help with the clinical treatment of patients at the moment, but might finally be able to answer the question of what causes this damn disease. But uh, anyway, that's maybe too much to hope for in just uh, the sort of studies we've done at the moment. Um, next up, we've got, um, I'd like to introduce you to Associate Professor Elaine Chong. Elaine is the um, Head of Ophthalmology at the Royal Melbourne Hospital uh, and also works as a consultant ophthalmologist on the corneal service at the Ionia um, Hospital. Today, she's going to tell us about um, an update on corneal collagen cross-linking. Over to you, Elaine. Thanks, Mark. I'll just get the slides up. So that's actually Erica on the title page here. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I can expect with um, cornea collagen cross-linking. So let's talk about, firstly, what is cross-linking? Secondly, what does cross-linking actually do? Thirdly, should we be cross-linking children? And fourthly, is cross-linking super scary? So just a general overview of what cross-linking is, just to remind you, if you look at the uh, surface of the cornea, that surface should actually be round like a soccer ball, but this looks a lot more like a cone. So that surface of the eye called the cornea is responsible for focusing the light into the back of the eye, which is called the retina. And so when you have a nice round surface, it focuses very well. And in a keratoconic eye, the light doesn't focus so well. So your vision is not quite as good. So this is a disease where the cornea bulges forward like so. So let me play a little bit of a multiple choice question with the audience. What is the prevalence of keratoconus in Australia? So basically how common is keratoconus? Is it one in 10? One in 84 when it's so obviously out of the ordinary of the A to D? Or is it one in 1,000, one in 10,000? So the answer is, one in 84. So it's actually more common than you think. So um, we've actually done a study um, in, in uh, Perth, um, uh, Western Australia, where we looked at the Australian population of people around 20 years of age. And we found that there was one in 84 uh, young people with keratoconus. So it's really qu quite high, com uh, higher than what we used to think in the past. All right, what are the risk factors for keratoconus? So basically what will make um, you have an increased risk for a keratoconus? Does rubbing eyes increase the risk of keratoconus? Or does ATOP? ATOP just basically means that um, you have itchy eyes and uh, you have eczema and just itchy skin in general. Uh, C, genetics or ethnicity. Straight after listening to Paul, I would suggest that you put that down. And D, floppy eyelid syndrome. So the answer for, is all of them. So all of these are risk factors for keratoconus. So rubbing eyes really, really increases the progression of keratoconus because it makes the cornea slip into a more conic fashion, okay? And atopy basically makes you want to touch your eyes even more and rub them. Genetics, Paul has given an excellent uh, talk on genetics and keratoconus and floppy eyelid syndrome. What is floppy eyelid syndrome? Floppy eyelid syndrome is when you pull up your upper lid, it just flops outwards. So you tend to sleep on, um, well, people with floppy eyelids tend to sleep on their side. And so they subconsciously or unconsciously rub their eyes leading to progression. So how do you actually diagnose keratoconus? So Srujana was, uh, um, pointed at the fact that usually we do quite a lot of tests to evaluate whether you have keratoconus or not. One thing we look out for is worsening vision with time. So sometimes you may not actually notice it until you go to your optometrist and they put on glasses and check and they go, oh, how come the prescription is changing with time? So that's worsening refraction. And on the right here, you see all these very colorful pictures that basically this, these um, maps map out the entire front part of the cornea. Um, and it can allow us to track changes over time. So we basically do a scan now 
and then do a scan later on, say three months or six months down the track, and we compare them to see whether it's getting worse or is it more or less stable. So we track changes over time and also clinical signs, but clinical signs are often quite late. So this is one of the clinical signs of advanced keratoconus. So what you really want to do is to, to basically pick up keratoconus before it becomes advanced. So if you have keratoconus, what should you do? First of all, do not rub your eyes because it's just going to lead to worsening keratoconus and use lubricants if you need to. But the most important thing is make sure you're monitored either by optometrists or your ophthalmologist. So in the previous talk, I had actually talked quite a lot about um, the other management uh, paradigms for uh, keratoconus. And if you're interested, this is the QR code here where you can just scan it. On, uh, on your phone and it will take you to the keratoconus webinar. So today, instead of going through everything, I'm just gonna focus on cornea cross-linking. So if you didn't get that, this is the QR code, or you can go to YouTube and type in keratoconus Center Viral Research 2020 for a more general overview. So I'm 15, what should I do if I have keratoconus? So can I have keratoconus if I'm a teenager or when I'm 12? So what should I do? Should I actually, if I have keratoconus, should I just rub my eyes really gently instead of rub it very hard? Should I ignore my vision until it worsens? Or should I change my parents? Or should I make sure I have regular follow-up? Unfortunately, you can't change your parents. And the answer is do not, please do not rub your eyes and do not ignore your vision until it gets worse. And Erica, you know, pointed out that often as a child, you never think that, you know, my eyes should be equal. You, you, you probably think that, you know, this is how I'm born with. So regular checkup is really important, okay? And the thing is with pediatric keratoconus, what that means is that people with keratoconus are younger than 18 years of age. So people, young people with keratoconus, the follow-up there is even more critical because they tend to progress faster. And often when it's picked up, um, it is really quite advanced and it's a lot more aggressive. So these are the this group of people below 18, we need to capture them early. So regular follow-up with your optometrist is important. So is there a correct time? Oops, sorry about that. Is there a correct time? When should I have cross-linking? Is there a correct time for cross-linking? So should I only have cross-linking if I feel that I cannot stop rubbing my eyes or once the diagnosis of keratoconus is made or when documented keratoconus progression occurs, or when my vision is worse than driving vision, or should I have keratoconus to improve my vision? So the answer is when documented keratoconus progression occurs. So cross-linking pretty much strengthens your cornea by about uh, four to five fold. So your finger is still way stronger than cross-linking. You still cannot rub your eyes after cross-linking, okay? So there's, it's a little bit debatable whether you should have cross-linking once keratoconus diagnosis is made. This, this group of people, pro this probably applies to more the pediatric cross uh, pediatric keratoconus where they are quite aggressive. But at the moment, what we're doing currently um, is to cross-link people who have documented progressive keratoconus, which means that we know that the keratoconus is getting worse with time, with follow-up. And the reason being, there's always risks and benefits with each procedure. So if, the, um, if you're not changing much, what should you actually take the risk of having cross-linking? So follow-up is key. So if you cross-link when your vision is worse than driving vision, unfortunately, cross-linking doesn't actually improve your vision. It mainly stabilizes the vision. So if you wait until your vision gets really bad and you cross-link it then, then the vision is just gonna stay around that poor vision. So early detection, close follow-up is very important. So I have cross, I have keratoconus. Should I have cross-linking? So cornea collagen cross-linking is for progressive keratoconus. Again, it is to stabilize the cornea. So stabilize it at that time point. So it is not a cure. We do have data up to about 10 years because it's a relatively new procedure. And there's actually many different protocols that are being used. The main side effect is uh, discomfort for three to four days after the procedure. And like I said, do not rub your eyes even after you have cross-linking. So you can see here on this diagram here, uh, before cross-linking, there's not a lot of uh, collagen fibrils or bonds between the collagen fibers. After cross-linking, the aim of which is to uh, 
create a little bit of chemical reaction leading to covalent bonds to form between the collagen fibers. So is cross-linking scary? So this is a video of corneal collagen cross-linking. There is zero pain. You do not have to be scared. In fact, most patients, when they, um, they get really worked up about the cross-linking, by the time they settle in and lie under the, uh, on the bed for cross-linking, they go, Elaine, this is so boring. Oh, I should have brought my audio books to listen to. So I don't think you need to worry about it, okay? So we, do, we, we, we give lots of anesthetic. There's no pain during the cross-linking itself. Cell. What we do is to remove the surface, the skin of the eye, and there's many different protocols. So one of which is to remove the skin of the eye, which is more, a lot more effective in the penetration of the drug into the cornea. So what we do is to uh, instill riboflavin, which is a vitamin B2. So we put eye drops, yellow eye drops onto the cornea. That's why it looks yellow. Okay, it's not, it's not because of Halloween, but it's yellow because of the eye drops. So, and after soaking the cornea, allowing the riboflavin to soak through deeper into the cornea, we use UVA, which um, photosensitize, which uh, basically causes the reaction with the riboflavin and then cause covalent bonds to form within the cornea itself. So there are actually many different protocols, which I'll show you what the depth of penetration is. After the, after the cross-linking, which takes approximately about 30 to 45 minutes, um, we put on a bandage contact lens, which is just a little contact lens in the eye. And after about one to two hours, unfortunately, you will start to feel discomfort. So often it'll be quite uncomfortable for about three to four days after the procedure, because after removing the skin, the skin needs time, about three to four days to heal over and cover the defect. So it's just like an abrasion on, the, on your hand in the eye. So you just need to allow your own body to heal over. And that takes about three to four days. And it'd be a little bit blurry for about two weeks or so. Okay. So you'll be on quite a lot of eye drops following the, following the cross-linking. Now, when do you change your glasses? So after cross-linking, the cornea shape does change a little bit. So the, your glasses prescription or your contact lens prescription might change. But typically, because there's some remodeling of the cornea or change in shape of the cornea, it takes about, uh, we, I mean, we suggest probably about three months after cross-linking before you change your glasses or contact lens. So this is a various type of uh, cross-linking protocol. So you can see different types of, if the epithelium remains on, it doesn't penetrate into the cornea quite as deep as the other type of protocols, okay? So there's many different types of um, uh, apart from epi on or epi off, there's also different types of intensity of the light. So the mo most conservative uh, treatment would be the Dresden protocol where there's a very deep penetration of the cornea. Thank you very much. Hope I answered your questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Elaine. That was uh, that was a very good overview of uh, of cross-linking, and there are a few questions coming through, which uh, you'll have to uh, elaborate on some of your um, of your slides. So we're looking forward to that. Before we get to the um, um, the, qu the questions, though, I'd like to introduce you to um, Bronwyn Sugden, who's our um, CIRA fundraising specialist. Um, many of you have already had the pleasure of speaking to Bronwyn if you've donated um, recently. Today, Bronwyn is going to speak quickly to you about um, what's happening with our upcoming uh, Christmas appeal. Bronwyn. Thanks so much, Mark. And hello to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm, I'm sure you found it as fascinating as I have. And thank you for bearing with me and not turning the leave as soon as you heard the fundraising word. And I think one of the greatest joys of my job is that I get to tell people stories. And part of the Christmas appeal this year, our festive appeal, we'll be telling Erica's story. Um, it was really interesting for me to hear um, Erica and Srijana have a chat tonight and to hear that she was diagnosed 28 years ago. And I was thinking back to what was happening 28 years ago and I quickly had a look on my phone and I saw that the type of mobile phones were bricks and they were this big and curved around our face with a small antenna and um, iPods had yet been invented and the computers that ruled the world were IBMs that came with the warning not to copy the floppy 
which I thought was fantastic. I haven't seen a floppy disk in, in so long. But, of course, we all know how quickly we took to technology. We all invested our hard-earned cash. We bought new phones. We had uh, great, um, you know, we, we really appreciated what this technology could do for our lives. It made it easier. It made it more enjoyable. And also let us think about what was possible. If, if we could do this, then... Could we possibly try something different? Could we make it faster? Could we make it different? Could we make it smaller? And it really revolutionised as to where tonight we're all joined together on uh, Zoom on multiple screens right across Australia and beyond. So I'm a little bit perplexed sometimes why people don't do exactly the same when it comes to research because, as you all know, for those of you who have a problem with vision loss or you're aware of vision losses in the family or there are genetic links. Research can also bring us exactly the same things as technology does. It can make our lives easier. It can make our lives more enjoyable. And it also lets us look forward to the future of, well, if this can be achieved in this amount of time, in 28 years for Erica, what could it hold for my future family, for future friends, for those that I know that uh, I can talk to them about? Um, keratoconus or any other eye disease that we may have. So tonight I'm really pleased to be able to launch our festive appeal, which will be featuring Erica as our, uh, our story. You'll get to read about her and her husband, Adam, who's been a tremendous support while she and her oldest daughters and her other daughters regularly go to their um, checkups and will hopefully benefit as and if the need arises, if they uh, develop further keratoconus symptoms and progress along the pathway there. If you'd like to join us and support the fundraising that supports the research that goes into the incredible work that's done right across CIRA, you can do so tonight at cira.org.au forward slash donate and thank you for making a difference every single dollar that we receive counts and it's really really appreciated by all of our researchers thank you so much thanks mark i'll hand it back to you thank you bronwyn uh, we really um do appreciate we've had some incredibly generous um philanthropic gifts um, which have supported the keratoconus research over the years and um we really can't uh, do without it at the moment um, now, look, we've been really getting some amazing questions through. Um, some of them are going to really test our panellists. Some of them might have been partially answered already. So we'll just um, we'll start at the top and, and work our way through as many of them as we can. Firstly, from uh, Michelle, and I think um, Elaine has mostly covered this, but is cross-linking a suitable treatment for adults? Hello. Oh, yes, yes. Um, Cross-linking uh, is definitely suitable for adults. Most of the studies actually started with um, adult participants and it's been shown to be effective 90 to 95% of the time. So it's a very good treatment for cross-linking. I'm uh, sorry, cross-linking is a very good treatment for progressive keratoconus from pediatric uh, keratoconus to adults. And sometimes it can still progress even through, you know, when you're 30, 40, some people still require cross-linking then. So, look, just following up on that, there was a similar question from Ray, which uh, he asked, um, how do you know when your keratoconus is stable? What's the average age for stability? And I suppose I like to think about it, there are three main sort of areas, aren't there? There's the, the, the keratoconus in your 50s where it's almost certainly stable, and those people don't need keratoconus, uh, don't need cross-linking. Then there's the, the paediatric group where they're progressing rapidly. They've got the severe end of the, of the spectrum and they almost certainly all do need cross-linking. But um, the patients that uh, we're talking about, that Elaine's been talking about in particular, are this group somewhere in between in the 20s and early 30s where, you know, they're probably going to progress, but we're not sure if they are or not. And um, they're the pa patients that we monitor really closely. And, uh, and by the time... You know, we've, we've seen you for a few years. We know whether you're going to be stable or, or progressing. Um, the next question. I guess, I, oh, I guess to answer the question also is that you kind of don't know where, whether you, I mean, based on the, what Mark was saying was based on general population, but pertinent to you yourself, you need to be monitored over time to ensure that you're not progressing using uh, basically vision tests and also Pentacam scans. 
So, again, Elaine, you talked about this a bit, but I'm going to pass this question to Srijana. Uh, it's from Topeka. What is the association between rubbing of the eyes and keratoconus? And I'm, I'm handing it on to Srijana because she's just written a, a lovely paper about this. As Elaine mentioned, definitely do not rub your eyes because we did a good systematic review, as Mark has mentioned, where we've looked at all the uh, literature review that has been done or the papers published on eye rubbing and keratoconus. And there is definitely an association with eye rubbing and keratoconus. Now, how it is associated is definitely not known, but uh, eye rubbing is associated with keratoconus, so do not rub your eyes. Probably one of the ways it is, it is having its influence, as Elaine mentioned, is because of the pressure that you put on the eye. It is causing the layers of the eye to be uh, affected. So that is the one of the causes, but how it affects, how it has its impact on the severity of keratoconus and things like that are yet to be evaluated. But the overall uh, uh, thing is that keratoconus is associated with eye rubbing, so do not rub your eyes. Thank you. Uh, now, look, this Sue's asked three questions, so I'll sort of bundle a few of them together. She wants to know whether we can prevent keratoconus. Is keratoconus genetic? And if so, is it a recessive gene? She says that... Both my son and I have keratoconus, but we can't find another family member with it, although perhaps some had mild, non-detected form of keratoconus. So, Paul, what are the chances of my grandson having keratoconus? Well, I mean, as, as I mentioned, there's a very greatly increased risk if you are in a family uh, where there already is keratoconus, uh, certainly compared to the general population. It doesn't mean, though, that you or your family members will definitely get keratoconus. It just means there's an increased risk. But if we can actually screen uh, family members for genetics, if we knew what genes were causing keratoconus, then we'd have a good idea of who might go on to get keratoconus. And so that's why we're doing all this genetic research to try and work out which genes are being passed on, which genes are important, and which genes are likely to cause the most aggressive forms of keratoconus. So it's not it's not a one-stop shop. It's a uh, different combinations of different genes. Um, some may be a little bit more aggressive than other genes. Uh, it may need, mean that you need certain environmental factors as well to push you over the edge. Um, it's, it's complex. It's not just one gene gives you keratoconus. Um, so it's not just recessive. There can be associations. And I think the world has changed a little bit in terms of keratoconus. It was thought to be just a, few, a couple of genes, but now we, we know that it's many different genes and it's looking more and more similar to many of the other common diseases in terms of uh, many genes being involved and associated with it. Thanks, Paul. Um, a good question from Muhammad. I'm wondering what is the next stage to diagnose keratoconus in its early stages? In addition, what do you think how um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms can aid ophthalmologists to predict keratoconus and be helpful for patients. Sujana, that one's been written just for you. <laughs> Very good question. Thanks for that question, Mohammed. Uh, that is exactly what we have been working on and we would like to pursue in the next year as well, where we would like to use the artificial intelligence to predict early keratoconus as well as predict the progression of keratoconus if possible using the artificial intelligence. So we are collecting these, we, or we have already collected in terms of uh, the early keratoconus, the Pentacam images from uh, the early keratoconus patients and compared them with the non-keratoconus patients to see what exactly are the differences between these two and come, came up with some algorithms uh, for the early detection so that we can objectively uh, screen these patients. Now, as the next step, what we would like to do is to see for the progression pattern, if we could uh, see which cases would progress or which patients would progress and which patients would not progress. So this is the next uh, innovative strategy that we would like to use in terms of AI. That's terrific. Um, the next question, um, Elaine, this is, this is one for you um, from Richard. I've read that keratoconus sufferers may develop cataracts at a younger age than the general population. Is this true? 
If so, could it be uh, due to reduced oxygenation of the eye from contact lenses? Um, well, it, I don't think that keratoconics actually develop cataracts much earlier, but you certainly can develop cataracts when you have keratoconus because almost certainly 100% of people develop cataracts as long as you live old enough. So I don't think it's right to say that keratoconics definitely develop cataracts worse. But having said that, to do a cataract surgery on a keratoconic patient, it is slightly more tricky because of the various lens options. Okay. The other thing is sometimes in uh, people with keratoconus, you might have um, some atopy and allergy. And if you require steroids for that, that can accelerate your, ca your cataracts as well. Yeah, I, th I agree. I think that's more of a risk factor than the contact lenses. I think mm -hmm. uh, the cornea objects to poor oxygen much quicker than the lens does. And you know, the, some of those old lenses that used to cause um, corneal swelling and blood vessels um, were due to poor oxygen uh, getting through the contact lens. We just don't see that anymore. Um, Elaine, while I've got you here, this is from, uh, I think someone must have missed your talk last year. It's Ethan. He says, uh, corneal implants are new to me as an option. What level of sight do they offer their recipients? Um, is that, are we talking about intrastromal cornea ring segments or are we talking about cornea transplants? I think he's talking about implants. So okay. maybe ring segments. Yeah, there's a few different types of cornea implants, but I, I presume you're referring to the intracornea ring segments, which basically what they, those things do, um, just to illustrate my the point, if this is the cornea, the front part of the eye, what they do is to insert themselves into the cornea so it tends it up a little bit. So instead of being on a cross section, a steeper cornea, it flattens the cornea up a little bit. So um, these ring segments, currently there's two main types, but what they do is to tense up the cornea in a certain fashion. One type is the artificial um, plastic-ish acrylic uh, lens segments that you insert into the eye. And the other type is a cornea-based uh, ring segments that you insert into the eyes. So these are still these are actually done um, not uncommonly, um, and they do kind of reshape the cornea. But it does not mean that you do not require contact lens or glasses after that. It just reduces maybe the severity or the extent of the prescription or astigmatism. Uh, but you still need glasses, contact lens after that, and they also have other um, issues, which include such as infection or extrusion. Extrusion means that the segment can actually rub its way through the cornea and extrude out, as in protrude out, and you might get a, there's a risk of infection with that as well. So I think watch this space. It's still, it's still an area that there's quite a, a lot of research and development into. So I'm not in a rush to um, uh, advocate for ring segments at the moment. Yeah, that's a good answer. So <clears throat> I agree. Um, another question here, which uh, looks like it's been directed to me, it's from uh, Larry. He says, how far away is stem cell regeneration of the cornea to restore sight? Well, I think it, it depends. So some, some we are doing stem cell uh, treatments at the moment, uh, not for keratoconus, but for the patients with uh, what we call limbal stem cell deficiency. So scarring it where they've got a depleted um, stem cells of the surface layer and we can um, either use um, donor cells or cells from the patient's own body that we amplify in the lab and then, um, and then remove the scar tissue and sew that onto the surface of the eye. Um, we've, we've been doing a lot of uh, lab work on using um, endothelial cells, so a different type of transplant, an endothelial transplant, culturing cells either from donor cells again or from uh, we're even trying to get... Um, induced pluripotent stem cells, so stem cells that we make from, from your skin or from hair and turn them into corneal cells. This is a, probably a little way off. This would be maybe five, five to 10 years away. Um, treatments for stem cell treatments for keratoconus, I think are, are even further away. We, we need to work out what the basis of the disease is. That's why the work that Paul and Sujana is doing so interesting because we can find out you know, what, what is triggering this, um, this softening and thinning of the cornea, then we can, uh, we can treat that specifically. So I hope that answers your question. Um, <clears throat> maybe we've got time for one last question. Um, 
So it's from Sue. Um, if a parent has keratoconus, at what age should they start testing their kids? I think that's a really good question. Elaine or Sujana, do you want to, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah. Um, I think there's one more thing you can blame your hormones and puberty. So <laughs> whenever, whenever you reach puberty, I think it's time to um, basically get your eyes checked. I think that would be um, pretty sound advice because um, your child at that age, usually they're about eight, nine, 10 or 11, whenever puberty hits, um, they will be able to read the charts quite well, get a baseline refraction, which means a baseline test of the glasses. And then now you have a baseline exam and then one or two years, or, you know, if there's any, if, if, um, if you're worried, you can do this every six months with your optometrist, which will be about built anyway. So you then track it over time. If the refraction of the glasses prescription keeps changing, then you know you have a problem. You need a referral to an ophthalmologist. Shujana, do you have anything else to add? I agree with you, Elaine. Uh, I would probably add to say that uh, uh, the first eye test for the children should at least be done uh, during the preschool years, just a bit more to what you're saying, just to rule out that they do not have any eye condition, mainly if the parents have any predisposing eye conditions. So uh, that would be the first stage as, I, as an optometrist, probably this is what I would say, that the first eye test for the children has to be done before they go to school, just to rule out that their vision is perfect, mainly because as Erica mentioned, most of the times the children would not be able to say if they have any eye concerns. And if the vision is good, if they're performing well at the school, and if the parents are not noticing any major eye concerns, then the next step, as Elaine mentioned, would be at their puberty and then a regular eye test. And the most important factor, as I always tell my patients here, is in Australia, we are fortunate that the eye care testing is bulked by Medicare. So why not get your eyes tested regularly, annually, when you can get it done? So, yeah. That's great. Uh, th thank you, Sujana, and thank you, everyone, for th uh, some really great questions there. I think that's probably um, our time. We're slightly over time. Um, if you have any more questions, um, send them through, and, uh, and we'll try and answer them um, if, if we can, maybe after the forum. Can you please um, join with me in a virtual round of applause to thank, thank all of the speakers? I mean, they've all put a lot of time and, and given some really good talks. So to to Jana, to Paul, and to, and to Elaine, as well as Bron. Thank you very much for your talks. Um, Thank we you. Hope, we hope in the near future we'll ever see you in person. I, let's hope this, this uh, forum, if we do it next year, will be actually in our brand new renovated um, offices up in Sierra. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to join us on our mission to better understand keratoconus and to find new treatments, you, you can support our work, um, as, as Bron suggested. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, last year we had uh, nearly 10,000 views of this, uh, of this forum. So we're obviously striking a chord and people are interested and, and want to um, talk to us and we want to talk to them certainly. So um, thank you everyone and have a great evening. Good night.